Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry, if I could just have your attention, please. Thank you so much. I'm sorry to uh, interrupt dinner, but we, we will get moving with proceedings, not least because um, we've got a, a, an audience on the live stream who isn't um, in the room enjoying uh, the beautiful meal and, and wine and conversation. Um, I did promise to just come up quickly and introduce a video from the CETA chairman, Diane Smith-Gander. Diane texted me earlier on today just um, expressing her disappointment at not being able to be here. Obviously, she's uh, based in Western Australia and has been enjoying um, the a certain aspects of that, <laughs> but enjoying it a little bit less at the moment. <laughs> but uh, we got her to pre-record uh, a message, so we're going to hear that now, um, and then Richard's going to jump up, and you're going to hear from our wonderful speakers tonight. So thank you, and enjoy your meal. Thank you, Melinda, for that introduction. Welcome to everyone in Sydney, and to all the live stream viewers from across Australia. I will begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land from which I am joining you, the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation. For many thousands of years, the Wajak people have shown tremendous resilience and leadership in the face of incredible adversity, and this year has proven no different. COVID has seen many Australians give up significant freedoms and choices in how we live day to day, with significant implications. This lived experience provides an important opportunity for us to pause and reflect on the disempowerment that Aboriginal people have experienced over many decades. My wish is that this reflection will drive a more constructive discourse in the next term of Parliament around a First Nations voice to lawmakers in our nation's seat of power. Before I touch on the year that has been, let me start with some formalities, including highlights from CETA's AGM held last week. Special thanks go to Miriam Silver, who retired from the CETA board last week after two terms and six years, three of those as the chair of our People and Governance Committee. Miriam has been a fierce advocate for South Australia, ensuring a strong voice for the state in board discussions. She's also a true champion and supporter of the importance of diversity and inclusion, social justice and equity, and responding to disadvantage in the broader context of economic development. In addition to her advocacy in the boardroom, Miriam has supported CETA programs, such as Women in Leadership, moderating and leading discussions over many years. On a personal note, Miriam, thank you for your dedication and your support of CETA. I have the greatest respect for you. The insights you brought to board discussions made my role as chair much easier. I have genuinely enjoyed our time working together. We are in the process of appointing a replacement for Miriam, obviously very big shoes to fill. At the AGM, Dr Pradeep Phillip was reappointed to the CETA board for a further three years. I am committed to a 40-40-20 policy for board diversity at CETA, and this reappointment gets us there. Now, not what you're thinking, not a gender split, but 40% practicing economists, 40% business people caring about policy, and 20% other. I really look forward to continuing to work with you, Pradeep. Tonight, I will briefly reflect on 2021 and take a look to the future. The 2020s are shaping as an incredibly important decade. None of us saw COVID coming. While we've been very focused, and rightly so, on immediate response, the remainder of this decade will bring big challenges well beyond COVID response. It is now, as we move to recovery, that we need to refocus on the broader challenges, and even more importantly, on the opportunities ahead. 2030 has been marked as the year to hit some big global targets, from the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals around ESG, to action on climate change. And 2030 is fast approaching. This decade is also when baby boomers start to turn 80, and that has significant implications for our society and our economy. From 2000 to 2020, on average around 25,000 people turned 80 per year. In the period from 2020 to 2040, 
that more than doubles to around 60,000 people turning 80 each year. This is the era when baby boomers come home to roost, bringing along with them the many economic challenges that are the dividend of this bulging generation. Fortunately, at the same time, emerging technologies are set to fundamentally change how we deliver services and more broadly, how business operates and for the better. This decade will be defined forever by the pandemic and the ongoing social and financial implications. My mother taught me never to be defined by what happens to me, but to be defined by my response. So this is the decade where we must finally address Australia's structural economic issues. The decisions made in this decade will define and shape Australian society for future generations. So this is where CEDA has dedicated our programs of work. As you, our members know, we have reshaped CEDA so we can reshape our work and lift our voice and impact. This reshaping has poised us to be front and centre in providing a clear and non-partisan voice on important policy topics for years to come. Your board has been humbled by the enthusiastic support of CEDA's members for these efforts. As we have implemented new research programs and new ways of interacting, the support of CEDA members, both old and new, has been just tremendous. The appetite to participate at a much deeper level, from in our member advisory committees supporting research programs, in our events and briefings, and through our podcasts and opinion articles. It has been so rewarding to see our members back our new approach. The willingness of CEDA's diverse membership base to contribute expertise and insights to our work means that CEDA can provide a unique perspective in the policy landscape. So thank you. I also want to call out the support for our programs from federal and state governments this year. The speed of response required in the last two years has been extraordinary. However, political leaders have still made time to participate in CEDA briefings and to discuss CEDA research. We are particularly encouraged with the positive signs around policy changes relating to our migration and aged care work this year. 2021 has been more challenging than we anticipated, but CEDA, with the support of our members, has remained strong, and I have no doubt will play an important role in driving policy discussions in 2022 and in ensuring that policy change can deliver strong social and economic outcomes for Australia. One sector that will be critical to Australia's long-term success is banking. It is integral to our economic and social stability. So I'm looking forward to an insightful discussion tonight and delighted CBA CEO Matt Coman and ABA CEO Anna Bly have taken the time to address CEDA. Thank you for your time tonight and I hope you enjoy the discussion ahead. Good evening and uh, welcome everyone. <clears throat> I'm Richard Spiro, the managing partner of Allens. Uh, I'd like to add my own acknowledgement to the traditional custodians on the lands on which we're meeting tonight, uh, the Gadigal people of the Aurora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here this evening. Uh, before I formally introduce our guests, I wanted to take a brief uh, moment to applaud you, Melinda and Diane and the whole team from CEDA on the fantastic work that CEDA does on facilitating public debate and, convers and conversation and particularly the support and leadership that you've shown the Australian community over the past two years. Uh, as Melinda mentioned, we've been a proud sponsor of this dinner for 12 years. Uh, and, a, and a member of CEDA since 1982, and I think CEDA does terrific work uh, in our community in fostering uh, uh, fantastic research and discussion. Uh, tonight's topic is our evolving banking sector, and we'll be speaking about the impact of the changes and challenges that sector has faced over the past few years, as well as looking forward to the next 12 to 18 months. 
Uh, we'll be framing our discussion around key themes of technology, customer centricity, the increasing importance of ESG, and the banker's uh, view of the outlook for the Australian economy. Uh, quite a bit to cover, I think. And who better than to talk about those topics than our special guest this evening, uh, um, the Honourable Anna Bly, the CEO of the Australian Banking Association, and Matt Coman, the CEO of Commonwealth Bank and Chair of the ABA. Uh, Anna and Matt's CVs are available on the tables and the CEDA website. I'm sure you're very well acquainted with them. And Matt was very specific in his instruction that I was to introduce him by saying, here's Matt. So uh, with that introduction, <laughs> if I could ask Matt and Anna to uh, come up on, onto stage, and we might welcome them on stage for this evening's discussion. I think we're, uh, is we're that, uh, yep, okay, great, thank you. Um, just a reminder, you can put your questions through the Pigeonhole app. All right, why don't we start with a, um, a broader question, and I might ask each of you just to part, uh, give a bit of a reflection on where we're sitting as a country and as a community at the end of what has been an extraordinary two-year stretch for all of us. Anna? Oh. <laughs> Um, I think we're all exhausted by the experience that we've had and everybody I've spoken to tonight is saying how much they're looking forward to a Christmas break. Uh, but I think at a broad economic level, um, there's a lot of reason to be optimistic. All of the data is telling us that, uh, you know, that people saved a lot during these times. They, we've, we're seeing households with very high savings rates. We've seen people uh, with a lot of pent up demand and we're certainly seeing, and Matt can speak more to the CBA weekly data, but you know I, I, they're putting out weekly bulletins on what people are spending money on. And the jumps in spending are quite astonishing. Uh, not surprisingly, in the first week of um, freedom in New South Wales, there was a 90-point turnaround in the expenditure on personal services um, compared to the same week in 2019. And I think we all accept that 90% of that expenditure was on hairdressing. Um, Speak but, for yourself. But, yeah, no, yeah, I think, yeah. I think just, no. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that pent-up demand is certainly being felt in the economy. You can see it already. The question, I think, is still how will that, will that be sustained? Um, you know, how that will play out in different sectors of the economy. But we're still seeing, uh, we're not at the end of it. I think that's a really important thing. This, we, this is not over for a lot of people. There's a lot of small businesses, there's a lot of families, a lot of individuals who um, found it really tough are being supported by hardship teams in banks and are still being supported by them. Thankfully, nowhere near as many as we had feared at the beginning of all of this, but there are literally thousands of Australians um, still being supported by those hardship teams. And I think 23 is going to be maybe a pretty tough time for um, hard conversations with some business, with a lot of small businesses. Um, and it probably depends on what happens next um, in terms of opening of international borders, opening of state borders, um, uh, reopening of you know, universities with international students. And until we see all of that come together, uh, I think there's still a lot of businesses that maybe aren't in the hardship team at Matt's Bank yet, but they're hanging on by the skin of their teeth. Uh, so I would say there's still big sectors, geography and sectors, you know, tourism in parts of the country, my home state of Queensland, for example. Um, there are sectors that really depend on international borders being open, international students, agriculture, etc. cetera. Um, but I still think there's a lot to be optimistic about. And I think we've all learned a lot about ourselves, about our community, about our neighbourhood, about our economy, about what we're capable of. And um, yeah, I'm really interested in the analysis that says what might come next is the equivalent of the roaring 20s in the last century. And I'm really hoping that that's true. <laughs> I, think, I think there was an article in the Sydney, Sydney Morning Herald today which suggested that the roaring 20s might be back if you go by restaurant spending. But, uh, Matt? Well, look, I think it's a, it's a very good summary from Anna. I, look, I think everyone's been through a lot over the last two years. I think people are 
feeling much more positive. We certainly are economically happy to talk about that in more detail. I think um, there's, if you think through the last 18 months, I, I think the, at the onset of COVID, it was really concerning. Um, no one knew what would, how things would end up. Things have been dramatically better, certainly here, than we could have anticipated or hoped for. I think this year, I personally, as a leader, as many people are in the room, I probably found energy levels were the flattest at around sort of July, August this year. That it was a, you know, it was a tough time. Because so 2020 was in many ways um, actually a very high energy environment and it was actually much better than people anticipated. And I think we, you know, this year looked like it was going to be a much better year, certainly at the start of the year. I think we went through some, some difficult periods. I think people are, um, yes, exhausted. If not exuberant, then certainly very positive. I think there's enormous uh, cyclical tailwinds in the economy going into the end of this calendar year and into 2022. I think there's a lot to be very positive about. There's still, yeah, absolutely uncertainty. I think many people are looking to see what's happening in Europe. Uh, you know, and it's, obviously COVID is so seasonal and, and, and seeing how that plays through. But, you know, and, and as Anna said, I think there's lots of things we've learned about ourselves, about our companies. You've seen an enormous resilience. I mean, across our, certainly our customer facing team, we're incredibly grateful for the people who've served in really tough, uh, you know, areas and conditions and dealt with like big retailers have and any big customer facing businesses. It's been a very stressful dealing with much higher levels of customer abuse, you know, physical threats, uh, and obviously, you know, financial difficulty is a very emotionally charged environment. Fortunately, that's been a fraction of what we expected. Um, and you, you've seen that in more recent results as people are writing back some of the credit provisions that, that banks took during that. So, I mean, overall, I feel like we're incredibly grateful. Uh, I certainly am. I feel like the team and the industry, but also I think you've seen a very positive role for businesses in Australia. I think it's fundamentally changed the narrative for many industries. I think the engagement with both state and federal politicians, both in government and in opposition, has fundamentally shifted for the, for the better. I, I, you know, I've seen levels of engagement and pride and CBA, which I'm sure are mirrored and reflected in many other companies, which you, know, you could only hope for because people have seen what a really positive and constructive role you can play when it really matters. And I think those stakes, um, you know, and I think we've been really fortunate for many of us, and you look around, like, where would you rather be right now? Uh, I, I think at various times during the year, it was a little bit, when you were looking offshore and you'd meet candidates and they'd sort of say, well, I'm not sure about Australia. I can come and, you know, I may never leave. Uh, <laughs> whereas, you know, I think we've all worked through that. You've seen the, uh, I mean, the challenges uh, across all levels, but, you know, I think there's an incredible resilience um, if you, even if you look at just the way the vaccination program and people's acceptance, you know, if you look at Austria or Germany, you've got like basically a third of the population refusing to get vaccinated. And you look at, I think, the way people are prepared to work through that, like you and I felt like just the community spirit is much higher. And so I think there's a lot of huge positives and hopefully we can take that through. I think definitely everyone is looking forward to a break. Hopefully things, everything stays open where people can travel, have a good time. Uh, and I think we come back into 2022 and 23 and, you know, a strong position. I think when you go way out into later this decade, not so sure how we sort of dismount from the, the current sort of uh, settings. But I, I think we've got a lot to look forward to in the in the year ahead. Uh, Matt, you, you talked about uh, the the positives, and what what are the positives you see that you'd like to bring forward into into next year and beyond? Well, I mean, I think you can see it at lots of different levels. I mean, I think as, as a start as a company and the things that we've learned as leaders and the way people, you know, what's worked and responded and some of the, I think, the techniques and mechanisms that we've all used to lead people through. And I think we've all seen what's possible under real, you know, pressure, but also when people come together, I've seen like levels of cooperation across industry, across industries, across regulators, across government. You know, in, in many ways, actually, you know, putting aside the horrors of the, the health aspects, I think some aspects of the way people were able to work, particularly when it really mattered, you would never want to lose that. Some of that drifts away, mm. I think, over time. Um, at least from the banking industry, there was a very sort of constructive process, and I think we were able to demonstrate the 
value of a, you know, a strong uh, banking system, but I know that's the case. Um, and so I think there's lessons both at, you know, in an individual leadership level across companies um, and, and across the seams of the, of the economy. I think it's really pushed people to think about you know, what does the future look like uh, and what are the things that we, that we really value here. And I think there's you know, a lot of those have been you know, on display and on show and there's, there's always things that you'd like to be, to be better, but also like fundamentally the context here in this country is extremely good. Mm -hmm. Um, I, look, I would, if I took it from an industry-wide perspective, uh, I think probably one of the things that's happened, well, I know one of the things that's happened as a result of um, having um, all experienced a, a serious life-threatening event, which in a country like Australia actually doesn't happen very often. There are other countries that it does happen a lot. Um, but, you know, it's not something we're used to. And when it happened, uh, there was, you know, it was coined Team Australia moments. And I think one of the things that we've seen is, um, if you look at things like the Edelman Trust Barometer, um, institutions which have not enjoyed a lot of trust and have watched trust get eroded, uh, whether that's banking, corporate Australia generally, government, uh, you've seen a recovery in um, a lot of those trust and reputation um, metrics. And because when it really counted, people saw Australian banks um, you know, behave in a way that perhaps they had not expected them to do. And there's nothing like a delightful surprise. Um, and that's what people experienced. They didn't expect it. And when banks did it um, and were there when people really needed it, that's why people felt, you know, why their emotions changed. And I think one of the big challenges for the industry and for the ABA, and I think probably for corporate Australia, um, as well as government, is how do you hang on to the trust that you've managed to regain in these times of crisis and peril. Because, you know, frankly, once that time of crisis is over, you know, people often sort of, it's easy to kind of, for that moment and that experience and that feeling to drift away, as Matt said. So I think, um, you know, we are, we're in a very disrupted world and we'll, we'll come to some of that about what's happening in banking at the moment. But in times of disruption, trust is, such a valuable um, currency. And it's really important, I think, that the industry continues to work, and it's a big challenge. How do we keep working in a way that hangs on to that trust and, and not, not treat it recklessly, because it's so hard won. And some of you will have heard me say this before, but you know, trust, um, it arrives on a tortoise and it leaves on a galloping horse. And, I feel like, um, you know, for the banking industry, we're still in the tortoise phase, but we are much closer than I think we could have anticipated um, a year and a half ago. So having made a big gain, and I think, you know, I think the country is better when people have trust um, that governments are well motivated and are trying to do the best for them. And I don't mean that in a party political sense. I mean, it, you know, not just the elected representatives, but the bureaucracy and the public service. And I think we've seen a lot of that eroded as well. And it's, it's, governments have had an opportunity to come right back into the centre of everything. And there's a challenge there for them to hang on to trust and reputation. Um, and if we, can, if we can all do that, then that will be a great legacy out of this experience. That would be a great thing for, for us all to take into next year, I think, and yeah. beyond, yes. Um, you mentioned technology, so I just wanted to switch gears a bit and talk about what's happening with technology and in, in the banking sector. I think we've all seen and be part of uh, the massive changes in technology over the past couple of years and the rapid accelera acceleration of change. Uh, the ABA's put out some really interesting research on how much technology, or what the technology use is like, and I think it was, 20% uh, of customers don't have, um, uh, prefer to do the, any banking at all in a physical branch. So how much do you think that will uh, stay in place going forward? Um, well, at an industry-wide level, Matt will have lots of colour and movement from inside his, um, his bank, but at an industry-wide level, it doesn't matter whether you're a big bank or a small bank, you are experiencing a level of disruption to your traditional model that I think is, um, you know, the pace of it is, I think, probably unprecedented in Australian banking. 
You know, people look back at the 80s and talk about you know, the big reforms of the 80s. And they were really significant um, economic reforms. But they weren't necessarily things that changed what every Australian was doing you know, every couple of hours every day. And this is. And so technology is you know, enabling um, and rapidly changing everything about how customers um, seek out services whether that's government services, whether it's their groceries, whether it's their banking, mm -hmm. whether it's you know, a new pair of shoes. It's every single thing is changing in ways, some of which you can see and clearly kind of grapple with and plan for. And I'd be interested in Matt's view of this, but there's a whole lot of it that who knows what's gonna happen in another two years time. One of the questions I get asked a lot is, what do I think Australian banks will look like? What will Australian banking look like in a decade? And I think, well, you know, it's a very brave, um, either, either you're very brave or very foolish to try to even answer that question. Um, I now do all of my banking with my phone and I pay for everything with my mobile phone. And I'm not seeing lots of nods around the room. You're all doing exactly the same. And all the women in the room, I don't know about you, but on weekends, I now leave the house without a handbag. I don't have a wallet. <laughs> it's actually not just changed the way I pay for things. It's actually changed you know, what I take with me when I leave the house. And, um, and that's, I'm never going back. That's never gonna go back. Um, and what that means, however, is that there's, I mean, a huge shift in customer expectation about convenience, speed, seamlessness, mm -hmm. um, but there's an equally big challenge for banks. People don't just want it fast and efficient and convenient and 24 seven. They want it safe and secure and they want their privacy protected. So the investment that's increasingly necessary for banks to manage that space where customers want to be and give them the same kind of security that having a massive building in Martin Place once gave them. Um, you know, I keep saying Australians, when you say the word bank, I still think most Australians think of a building, even though that's actually not how most Australians now are banking. So technology is changing absolutely everything, I think, about how Australians are banking, how they're thinking about it, um, and then how banks are thinking about where they put their investments and how they prepare for what customers want. Um, but there's also, it's not just technology, um, and there's whole new business models. So things like buy now, pay later. Yes, they're using a technology platform, but it's actually, it's a different way of thinking about how you pay for things. It's a different, you know, to getting credit through a credit card, for example. And just that little shift in that business model is dramatically changing how particularly um, young Australians, not exclusively, but, you know, predominantly young Australians are buying things and mm -hmm. transacting. Um, so they're not, they're not using, they're not tapping and go. They're doing something on, you know, Afterpay or Zip or mm -hmm. one of those platforms. Um, so the one other thing I'll just say is one of my member banks in a forum last week said in March last year that they had never written a home loan um, on a Zoom platform. And in September, 50% of all of their new home loans were done on um, the equivalent of Zoom or Teams. And so I don't know what, that, that wasn't Matt, so I don't know what his numbers are. But, but it just mm. is, I think it's a good, it's, I, I, it captured my imagination because I thought, you know, that's in 15 months, 16 months, um, and you can kind of understand why. Um, but that really then changes what bankers do, what times of day they're doing it, where they're doing it from, um, you know, where you employ people, how you employ them. Um, and I think uh, you know, Australian banks are starting to look, feel and act a lot more like technology companies. They're employing more coders than they are tellers. And that's because everybody in this room has dramatically changed how they access money, how they pay bills, how they check their account, and as I said, it's not, you're not gonna go back. Will, will the pace of change stay, Matt, do you think? Oh, I think it will only increase from here, I think, it, and forever it will be so. I mean, I think there's been, been a big structural accelerant in terms of customer preferences, a lot of that driven by necessity based on you know, people's inability to deal in a face-to-face -face environment. And from our perspective, we think, you know, certainly the perception and also the ability to deal and go to a branch or go to a you know, physical manifestation, particularly when they want help, uh, is absolutely still important. But I, mean, I, think, I think strategically, as, as rapid as the changes felt at the moment, particularly in terms of software and technology development and innovation and competitive intensity across industries, it can only increase. 
It always has, it will. You know, there's an abundance of capital available, there's liquidity, there's a lot of, and I think that's a really exciting time strategically. I think that's great for customers. I think it uh, will reward companies that are prepared to invest for the long term. I think the value of technology leadership in and around both the customer experience, I also think it's a, it's another really important element of what you want to look for in leaders, both in the day to day and over the, as part of sort of the, the future of what you recruit and the talent. Not that everyone needs to be actually writing lines of code, but actually fundamentally understanding how technology, I think, is reshaping you know, many industries and will continue to do so. You know, I, I can only see it accelerating, but I think it's something that we should embrace. I mean, clearly, customers, uh, we will uh, always be trying to balance between. Uh, people who you know don't want to trade convenience. We've we've had more digital adoption, absolutely. You know, very significant shift. But there's still customers who, given the chance, would prefer to be able to use their passport, come into their branch. You know, and I understand that. And part of that, for being the Commonwealth Bank, is you have to be able to deal with, you know, the the full spectrum. We really are the bank for all Australians, and we need to be able to, uh, you know, adjust with that. But you know, with that comes enormous uh, scale and the opportunity to make investments that perhaps others can't to try and innovate that customer proposition. And I think you know, the way people interact with both banks and I think all businesses today is it, it, actually, I don't know whether it's three, five or seven years, but it's a pretty big step that's been made. Mm. And it'll be interesting to see where that settles, particularly in retail and how much of that goes back to you know, physical stores versus e-commerce. But they're all, um, you know, is there a, a chance that I, I guess proportion of investment and spending across industries is you know, reduces in technology? I don't think so. Um, but, I, but as I said, I think that's a, that's a, it's a great time to be uh, able to improve that service proposition. You look at the convenience we all enjoy now versus you know, five, seven, you know, let alone 10 years ago. I mean, you wouldn't trade it, uh, with the possible exception of my teenage daughter. If I, if I wrenched that mobile phone out of her hands for the next five years, I'd be very happy. There's a massive problem around the way teenagers interact. But putting that to one side, I, th I think for people who've got some self-control and discipline over <laughs> technology, you know, there's enormous opportunities and potential. Yeah, I, I, I might just add on that because I think the temptation in these kinds of discussions is to kind of operate from the assumption that most people behave rationally most of the time and that there'll be just this rational kind of continual uptake of opportunities that technology presents. And one of the things that I think COVID taught us is, or reminded me, um, is that you know, human beings are very quirky people, quirky creatures. And um, on the one hand, you saw the pandemic accelerate um, rapidly, trends that were already well and truly on their way. Um, and one of those was cashlessness, or you know, mm -hmm. people not using cash. So um, we now see far, far, you know, the, the rate of cash being used for transactions is just plummeting. And you'll remember most merchants said in early COVID particularly, we're not going to take cash because they were worried that it was a source of infection and transmission for their staff and their customers. And so, you know, trans tap and go transactions, et cetera, escalated. But while cash was dropping dramatically for transactions um, and paying for stuff, um, the RBA was actually printing. They printed more money during the pandemic. And their explanation for this is that people still derive emotional and psychological comfort from having $1,000 in cash in the jar, in the kitchen cupboard. And you know, I, I think that does go to it's, a, it's, it's not something that's easily predictable in terms of what people feel comfortable with. So, um, you know, there is, there's all this, there was a lot of cash withdrawn from branches and ATMs, but it wasn't used to, to pay for things. And there was still the same kind of levels of spending on groceries and other things, but... Yeah, that's and I think that's right. And, and I think some of the things that were really interesting during COVID, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, search for you know, trust and big brands. And I remember we were very small teams that have sat down early on. We tried to like just distill all of the different packages and try and put it on a simple page on the ComBank website. Well, you know, we got more than 5 million visits. You know, and I, and I do think it shows, and you talk to a lot of media proprietors and business, they've had a great, actually, sort of 18 months because you know, that, that thirst for a credible, trustworthy source. And so I think there is... Of course, disintermediation and you know, preferences will shift. I think there's also a really big opportunity uh, to deliver, as you were saying earlier, that really sort of 
safe, secure. I mean, one of the downsides, at least at the, at the moment as well, is huge increase in scams. And, um, you know, fraud's always been an issue, and, and that, that's right. But, I mean, if you look at the way people are actually preying, particularly on uh, you know, more disadvantaged, but also with, you know, very rapidly um, improving sort of quality of scams, as a, I won't use the exact example, but a, a chairman of a very well-known ASX sort of 20 company got a, an email from me uh, where, you know, I was having problems, uh, taking some... And I, I thought there was a really good opportunity to invest in this crypto. Uh, not that I'm trying to segue into that topic. <laughs> and, I, and, and apparently I'd just spoken with Joe, which could only be Joe Longo. And, and like all you needed to do was send the 10 you know, Ethereum to this address. And it was hilarious that the chairman took one look at it and said, oh, let's obviously let Matt CA know that. Uh, but you know, there is actually people are getting better and more sophisticated and people pretending to be well-known service providers or uh, you know, cable, TV, you know, all of the SMS. I mean, we look at a lot of the research, remember mm. the ABA? I mean, it's, it's, I don't know, 70 or 80% of people are regularly being targeted by scams. And, mm. and, and we see how that manifests in, I mean, enormous losses and losses of productivity. Mm. I think that's a big issue, not just for the banking industry, but, but more broadly. I mean, the, the sophistication of some of the, you know, the criminal elements uh, that are really targeting people is, has gone up dramatically. Speaking of crypto, uh, Matt, um, yeah. <laughs> he's been waiting for this. <laughs> well, I wasn't going to bring it up, but since you did, no, please, um, I can't go anywhere without talking about crypto. So <laughs> why would this be any different? Um, so, you, uh, well, CBA's involvement in, in, in crypto, and you said it's the, the really big risk for the bank is not being part of it. Obviously, regulators, ASIC, uh, talking about the, the risks and the volatility. So how do you weigh up and balance those risks when you decide to, to bring the Commonwealth Bank into, into something like that? Yeah, look, and this is going to be, we can talk about this for as long or as little as you'd like. I think it's a very interesting multi-dimensional space which has various applications uh, both in the near term as well as strategically. So differentiating between sort of the technology. You know, a big company, you want to build capability, you want to build credibility, you want to understand. We firmly believe we'd rather have a sort of a seat at the table and be understanding versus, uh, you know, certainly offshore. I think many financial institutions look at that space and expect or hope that it'll be regulated out of existence. I think that's unlikely. Uh, but there's lots of different sub-elements within that. I mean, so... Particularly in the investment, I think in the investment category or people who are investing in crypto, which is one of the areas that we've said that we will, on a pilot basis, uh, uh, start offering. I think many of us would be hard pressed to identify a sector which is, ex which is accelerating at the rate uh, in terms of you know, customer. And, and there's both research on the topic, I won't use the exact numbers, but we can see the level of interest in terms of customers and transfers into that sector, I think it's accelerating and has accelerated, particularly over the last 18 months, at a rate that for a financial institution you need to look very closely at. Now, you know, putting that to one side, I, I, a couple of, and I'm sure every, well, maybe it's just me, because where, where I go, people want to talk about, particularly since we announced um, that we were uh, you know, going to provide an offering in crypto, people want to talk about it. So you know, just in the last week, I've had um, Someone was telling me that you know the barista had successfully sort of punted crypto and paid off their home loan in the last uh, week. I was talking to a CEO two days ago, one of their uh, you know, in financial services, not a bank, uh, was talking about someone who was um, you know up and coming and very talented was quitting because they wanted to trade crypto full time. They managed to do 40x, uh, which is a pretty fair achievement. I think there's relatively few. Uh, asset classes over time that people were able to sort of trade at that sort of return in, in a period within uh, 12 months. I caught up with some school friends on the weekend. One of them sitting on, you know, it's like I find it, it's a divide. There's half the people that are fully engaged and are either ideological or just committed. Others are just completely skeptical. What the hell are you talking about? One sitting on a very large paper gain on NFTs, absolutely impenetrable about whether they should be uh, selling those. The other was saying, walking out of their apartment block and said, 
my cleaner uh, for, for the building came up to me and said, I've just moved my entire self-managed super fund into crypto. And, and my question was, please tell me you told them that was a really bad idea. <laughs> no, because I don't know what's going to happen. That's true of all of us. But you know, if there's one thing, it is a, you know, so purely in terms of like dollars, interest, and what's happening, I think there is both enormous potential and huge risks. And I'm sure it's shared by many others, certainly in our experience. Uh, if, if and perhaps when people lose money, it's rarely that people look in the mirror as the, the, the starting point. Uh, now they look for at who, you. For who's behind those <laughs> losses, not just me. Uh, and so I, I think there perhaps is a little bit of an expectations yeah. gap. I'm not sure everyone either A, fully understands it, B, some of the protections around that. And so from our perspective, you know, we want to have a seat at the table. We, like, we think it's important. We want to work with regulators. It's a very ambiguous area, not just domestically, but also globally. And we think that's an important, we've tried to find you know, some partners that allow us to offer a, you know, a secure offering. And I don't know what happens to the asset class. I don't know what happens with prices. Do I, you know, every asset goes through difficult periods, but do I think there's long-term applicability and enormous amounts of investment and innovation? Absolutely. So I, I think it's highly unlikely it, it disappears. And so for us, you know, as part of the, I guess, investments we want to make in customer experience and, uh, and technology, we thought it was really important to participate in that. Um, Matt mentioned customer experience and customer centricity. Anna, there's been a lot of talk about that in the banking sector and how banks are trying to become more uh, customer centric. What, what does that mean for the banking sector in, in practice? Oh, that's a very big question. Um, uh, look, at a really macro level, I think it would be fair to say that you know, the overarching um, sort of message, rhetoric, um, or, you know, sort of feeling, if you like, post the Royal Commission was, you know, Kenneth Haynes' words about mm -hmm. banks put profit before people. They're putting their profits before the interests of their customers to the point where that has caused customer harm. And I think, as I said earlier, what COVID did was present Australian banks with an opportunity to... Um, well, to prove that wrong, and that's exactly what they did. Um, every bank took a profit hit. Every bank took a hit to their share price. Every bank took a pro hit to their dividend. Um, you know, just about every um, senior banker took a hit to um, remuneration in order to ensure that there were sufficient provisions in place to look after those people who were in real trouble. And you don't, you know, it's kind of a you've got to be careful not to be tried about this, but you should never waste a crisis. And there's, every crisis presents you with an opportunity, I think, to sort of rise to an occasion and to demonstrate the best part of yourself as an individual and as an organisation. And that's what happened. Um, but it happened, you know, it's important, I think, to acknowledge that it happened in the context of a series of events, including, you know, Kenneth Hayne, um, where trust had got quite broken. And every bank um, who's a member of the ABA, and I'm sure other financial institutions I'm less familiar with, but every single bank I know has been, uh, of every size, has been working, you know, just sort of so assiduously um, to turn that around to the extent that it's a problem internally. Um, they've been working internally to address issues around culture, processes, remuneration, what are they incentivising? Um, you know, where are they getting those things wrong? And making some really hard calls. Um, you know, Matt's got plenty of examples where he's had to ask some of his people to take, um, you know, take a different remuneration package, to think differently about what they get rewarded for, to think about different kinds of metrics that are sometimes, you know, harder to gain, you know, or maybe harder to count. Um, and that creates uncertainty, which you don't want to do for your best people. Um, so there's some pretty hard yards just being systematically done inside every bank. Um, of course, you know, some, the issues are different for different banks and for different shaped banks and different size banks. Some of the issues are internal. In some cases, though, for the whole industry, it's also about external perceptions. And you know, one of the things that we've tried to do as an industry is make sure that 
I mean, you know, if you're not telling your own story, no one else is telling it for you. And actually making sure that as an industry, member banks are investing in telling Australians where help is available if you're in trouble because of COVID, um, how to protect yourself against scams. Um, you know, just being out there and talking as an industry. I mean, I, I don't reduce, I don't want to reduce it to, you know, just a brand, but, you know, there's brand Combank, brand Westpac, brand NAB, you know, brand, I see Malos back there, brand My State, you know, whatever the bank is. But then there's actually brand bank. And you could be doing great things inside your organisation. But if your colleagues are, you know, kind of pulling the whole name of the institutions down, it's, you're fighting an uphill battle all the time. And so I think what's been really important in the last couple of years is the way that banks have cooperated where it's appropriate for them to cooperate, competed where it's appropriate for them to compete. So, you know, competing, you know, having competitive products that are better outcomes for customers, but then cooperating on things like what should our code of practice say? You know, how should we, um, you know, treat customers who have experienced a scam? How should we treat people who can't pay their mortgage during COVID? These are all things, and it's interesting for me because when I get all of these CEOs around a table, their instinct is a competitive instinct. Um, they don't all sit around and hold hands and sing kumbaya, you know. <laughs> um, you know, and often I'm suggesting, I think, you know, this is something that I think it would be good for the industry to do. Often their first instinct is, oh, no, I think we'd rather do it our own way. And you don't want to lose that. That's actually a really important instinct. You actually want them to be fiercely competitive on product, on price, on service um, offering, etc. But actually having the sort of maturity as an industry to know the things that you should do that are best done cooperatively for customers, I think it's been, a, it's been quite an interesting change, I think, Matt, mm -hmm. I'd say, in the last three years. Um, a, mo a willingness to align more often or to try to find alignment, not always getting there, but try to find alignment on the things that it is best done cooperatively and accepting that there are some things where it's in no one's interest to compete. You know, why does it, you know, really there's nothing, you know, in it for to say I'm the bank that does the best deal for victims of domestic violence. You know, actually it shouldn't matter where you bank if you're being, you know, if you're being financially abused. You should have confidence that you can walk into any bank in this country and you will get the protection that you need. Um, you know, if your grandmother's being ripped off, if you're, you know, all of those sorts of things. There shouldn't be a competitive advantage on that. Um, and that, that actually really goes to the whole question then of trust in the industry. Yeah. Do you I think, think Matt, that's a shift. Sorry to say, Matt, you've talked about the, wanting the CBA to be the most trusted partner uh, in the centre of customers' financial life. And I guess that's, that's the outworkings of, the, of customer centricity. Yeah, I mean, look, it's just a couple of very quick thoughts. I mean, to, to, to Anna's point, one of the, the, there's a whole range of things we never discuss, not just because they're illegal, but we just don't at an industry level. I mean, sometimes I get questions from like other policymakers. What do your peers think about that? So I've got absolutely no idea. Like we'd never talk about it. But when it actually comes to the ABA, when it's around customer, I, I, I mean, it, it's been incredibly positive the way the industry stepped forward and with no uh, reluctance. So I think that's a huge positive. I mean, touching briefly, you know, I spent quite a bit of time in both 18 and 19, particularly 19, um, sometimes with our institutional customers and people were talking about, you know, what's it like in a Royal Commission and uh, if you can avoid it, do. I mean, <laughs> do. Uh, it. Really, really challenging process, very difficult reputationally. I did eight and a half hours in the witness box. I wouldn't recommend it for others. Uh, not fun. Uh, you know, we set a prudential inquiry review. We've responded to that. It's been a lot of time. And, you know, across the industry, I think there's just an enormous amount of work, which I, I can't and I won't try to sort of summarise. But fair to say a lot of, you know, thought and effort right across the industry, which I think has been extremely important. And then look, coming back to, to, I guess, the centre of your question, absolutely. We, we see that as um, extremely important and you know, and trust is you know, a little bit, as Anna was saying earlier, it's something you can lose really quickly. Uh, and it's also, you know, the actions across every one of the customers and I think for, for many people here, uh, I guess one of the lessons, many, but one of the lessons for the banking industry as well is you, know, you really have to think through the 
like not just how do you think, hope, and expect most customers will experience and what will be the, the outcome, but also like what's the adverse and what's the set of situations and how could something go wrong and how, what, what are the product design features which could also be flaws and how can they... Be, and we've spent a lot of time like really trying to understand that, which um, I think is really thoughtful and important because in financial services and I'm sure in you know, many other industries, obviously healthcare being one, you know, when it goes wrong, it's, it, it really goes wrong. Mm. Uh, and I think it's, you know, it's good that people see what that's like. And, you know, when, if something goes wrong in a credit cycle, uh, you know, if people lose money, or they lose their life savings, it's incredibly traumatic. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think by and large, the industry sort of come together and galvanised extremely well. And, you know, we'll, we'll keep pushing and, We'll continue to innovate. Of course, that's one of the things that we'd like to win. Uh, deliver the you know the best proposition for for those of you who don't bank with CBA. We'd would love to be able to help you. There's a number of CBA <laughs> people here, so they should put up their hands and support any non-CBA customers. Um, but you know, it's an incredibly important part of uh, of that. We, we take that really seriously. Uh, whether that be sort of data, privacy, security, fraud, just having the best you know overall customer proposition and. You know, something we want to stand behind and, and earn every day. I think the other thing I'd add in there, because it's not just banking, um, you know, I think we are witnessing, and we talked about technology earlier, we're, we're actually witnessing one of the biggest shifts of power from institutions into the hands of customers and citizens um, that we've seen, you know, probably ever. And, and, it's, never, and it's not going back. The power is, you know, the, the kind of all-knowing bank manager that tells you what to do as opposed to you demanding what you want as a good product. You know, that shift has happened. And, and it's happened not just in banking. It's happened in, um, you know, in, in pretty much, you know, every sphere, uh, including for government. Once upon a time, you had a bad experience with your bank. You went home and talked to your family about it. You told your friends that you weren't happy. You might change bank. And that's kind of the end of it. You know, now you go home on Facebook and you, know, you tell them what happened and you'll suddenly find 40 other people around the country who had the same experience with the same bank. And suddenly you've got a campaign, you know, something that might have once upon a time been a complaint about a product that, you know, pro that should have been and could have been fixed, but um, you know, was just sort of random little issues, one in Perth, one in Darwin. You know, literally within hours, a customer who's had a bad experience can amplify that into something that symbolises something about a company. And so everything you get wrong matters more than it ever has, it seems to me. That, you know, you can't just say, oh, well, of course, we're always going to get complaints, bad things happen. You've actually got to say, you know, get on it because it'll get on you. <laughs> and that, you know, that's a real shift. Mm. In, that's a power, that is an, a, an empowerment that, um, you know, that has shifted the balance. Mm -hmm. And it's um, and it's something that banks I have to grapple with, but so does so do government, so does everybody else. I had a few uh, questions come through on um, on the topic of ESG, so I, I might switch over to that if that's okay. I, I might ask if you each might uh, talk a little bit about the role of banks in this space, in particular, perhaps getting the balance right between the uh, interests of shareholders, retail customers, corporate customers, and, and staff. You want to start on that? Yeah, maybe too. Um, I mean, look, fundamentally our role is to act and serve the country. And I mean, that's all of the country and the economy. And we think about that in terms of the economic recovery and transition. I mean, secondly, we're, we're obviously the banking industry are part of the capital allocation. And so, I mean, we get a lot of, uh, it's a very important topic. It's an area that we spend a lot of time, uh, both on disclosures, reporting, but also strategically. And I think that's shifted quite a lot uh, in the last few years. We, th we see it as a, you know, a risk that we need to manage, but also a tremendous opportunity. I think for companies that are able to really um, be able to step into that you know, structural tailwind, I think it is an enormous opportunity. There are some big challenges. I think it's an extremely complex area I mean, for us, obviously, there's more of a lightning rod around fossil fuels. You know, that's less, less than 2% of our balance sheet. It's not to say that it's not important, but there's a lot more uh, than that. I mean, I think it's both the economic, we, we would say, and some of the work that we're doing, we announced a partnership with CSIRO, is about you know, understanding both that as well as the economic and social. I know the BCA have done some work there. 
I think clearly, I mean, by and large, a lot has happened in this space, uh, you know, in the, even in the last sort of six to eight weeks. Um, I, I can't imagine a time in the next decade or mo more that it's not a really prominent and you know, mainstream issue. And then just trying to get the balance right. I mean, we get asked all sorts of questions. In some ways, it would be easier to, do, to take certain actions, but we don't think it would be the right thing to do in terms of supporting, and particularly Australian companies who want to support the decarbonisation or investing in, in part of that. Uh, but we're, we're constantly trying to get that balance right with various uh, stakeholders, we think we got it sort of about right this year, and we've already started on a whole range of different activities and work and reporting and uh, analysis that we're going to deliver next year. You know, we work closely with both uh, you know, peers internationally and a variety of you know, different stakeholders and, of course, investors. And I often find sometimes investors are really just interested in how does the banking sector think about it because they're dealing with it across multiple sectors. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's a very prominent you know, if I put alongside what is the future of the financial system in Australia and, you know, what sort of financial system do we want in Australia and there's a whole lot of different dimensions to that along with sustainability broadly defined but clearly climate, probably the, you know, two of the biggest issues and huge resonance across, you know, internally. That was the interesting, I want to go back there and I'm tempted fate now, but, you know, the, even talking about crypto internally is the most... Uh, enthusiastic, most engaged response across, you know, 40,000 people which gives you a sense. Similarly, you know, we ran a, you know, climate conference with our institutional clients uh, a few weeks ago. We've had uh, thousands of training sessions. You get enormous adoption because people are really passionate about it and really want to understand it, want to understand the role that they can play. And, and again, I think Australia has got, uh, you know, a lot of opportunities to, to tap into. There'll be, you know, at times furious debate about whether we're doing enough and what are the impacts. And I you know, have a lot of empathy for you know, people who are worried about the impact on their community. And their, I think they're really uh, important questions, but I think they're things that we need to work through. And I was recently talking to the CEO of a very large uh, international bank. And um, you know, I, I think in many ways, you know, Australian industry and not just the banks, but you know, I'm sure many of us participate in lots of different groups you know, uh, with, with various CEOs. I, I think the business community in Australia, in Australia is extremely engaged in this topic and actually very thoughtful uh, you know, and compares very well with, you know, with many countries. I think Europe's probably leading the way, uh, but there's, you know, there's a lot of uh, you know, active work uh, underway. And, you know, again, I think it's something that we shouldn't necessarily, in aggregate, fear. It's something we should really embrace and look to maximise the opportunity. Which, Anna, ties into a question we got about the roles of banks being able to, uh, I guess, talk about that message more broadly, talking to governments, talking about the transition. What role does the banking sector have in that de debate? Um, look, I think this one's a really interesting one um, when it comes to thinking about what should be done cooperatively at an industry level and what should be done competitively at an entity, you know, a company level, uh, you know, at a broader level, you know, Matt's started by saying, you know, if banks, if the role of banks is to serve the country, what is the task here? And if Australia and the rest of the world is actually going to successfully transition to a low carbon, no carbon economy, um, you know, without arguing about which year that's going to happen in, um, it's going to require funding. We are going to have to fund it. We're going to have to fund new ways of doing stuff. And you know, banks and financial institutions um, and other investors, you know, like superannuation funds, are all going to have to take a real leadership role and think very differently than they do now about you know, what are the priority, where do they put money, um, you know, what makes sense, how do you move out of some sectors and into others. And so at an industry level, the way we're thinking about it at the ABA is those things which um, actually need to be done and probably some of them needed to be done yesterday um, and by in other jurisdictions have been led by sort of government or semi-government agencies, particularly in Europe. Um, you know, the industry re has basically recently come together and said, right, we need to get what the things that make sense and, and aren't competitive. We need to have some consistency on our sort of scenario analysis that we do with customers and sectors. We need to um, get consistency about our reporting metrics um, we need to have consistency in our measurement tools. Uh, you know, if you're a farmer 
and you, you know, a lot of big agribusiness have two or three bankers and an, you know, an insurance company. You don't want them all using a different measurement tool to decide you know, where you are on the scale of um, you know, transition readiness. So there's some really deep, important work there about what are the things we need consistency on, and there's a whole lot of, as I said, you know, sort of metrics, um, you know, overarching framework, metrics, and then disclosure. There's no point um, for you as an um, investor or a shareholder or um, you know, a, um, a client of a bank you know, wanting to see what Combank's credentials are if they're apples and oranges with ANZ's reporting. You, know, you need to know, have some consistency. So that's a big piece of work we're working on. But then there's the competitive stuff. And you know, I think for a long time here and globally, when the financial world and when regulators have been looking at the issue of climate change, they have seen it very much through a risk lens. And sure, there is a very big risk lens that needs to be applied, but there's a big shift happening that's about actually this is an opportunity. And rather than just seeing this as a problem that I have to deal with, it's how can I elbow everybody else out of the way to get that investment opportunity? <laughs> and that's exactly where I think you know, you're going to see a lot more competition between individual banks about the sort of the products that they're offering, the sustainability loans they're designing. Um, you know, I suspect, you know, Matt, you're going to be offering things to your customers, as are the other bankers in the room, in three, four years' time that just are kind of beyond your imagination at the moment because it's moving that quickly. And so I think a lot of what banks can and will achieve in this is going to be done com competitively. You're going to see people literally climbing over each other <laughs> to get to opportunities, and that's a good thing. Um, out of that will come some incredibly innovative ideas and products and tools to help the transition. And then we need to be able to describe that and measure it and uh, with a degree of confidence, certainty and consistency. And so that's where the industry piece comes in. And if you put those two things together, then there's a really important role um, for banks and finance. Um, as I said, we're not going to get from here to there without being able to fund a whole lot of things that currently don't exist. Uh, question uh, you mentioned uh, earlier, Matt, talking about the future of banking. There's a couple of questions that have come through regarding demographic changes and what that means for the future of banking. So things like boomer retirement, uh, challenges of home ownership, uh, emerging generations whose relationship with the bank, or with any bank, might not be the same as has been in the past. What do those things mean uh, for the bank for banks going forward? Yeah, look, I mean, <clears throat> all of the, I, the, I guess it shows the relevance of really understanding, deeply understanding, and then trying to anticipate customers' needs. And that yes, preferences shift, and there's you you can uh, study deeply differences in demographics and segments, and of course those preferences have changed. There's also, I think, a space that's consistent across that. I think. You know, definitely what you'd see in some of the work that we do and some of the customer research that we do, and I'm sure others do, even actually if you, if you actually study and watch the way, particularly I'd say in the school and uni students, the way people actually shop, spend their time, how they uh, express themselves in a digital uh, world, I think that's quite different. Um, you know, I think we, we are very, uh, engaged in making sure that we've got you know very relevant propositions across you know many different uh, I guess targeted needs. I don't know if it's more diverse than it has been. It, 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 if you went through you know different cycles, definitely there's very divergent needs and requests that we see from customers. You know we feel you know the Commonwealth Bank has done well because we've been able to serve uh, you know customers at scale over a long period of time. And, and I think you know, technology gives you the opportunity um, to be able to do that and, and for us to be able to invest in. And there's a whole range of different experiences that we're building out, particularly digitally, uh, and investments in data and analytics and some of the you know, analytical sort of techniques that can sort of power a very personalized and relevant experience that delivers real value for customers uh, in a way that they feel that we're, you know, of course, trusted and secure, and, and I think you used the words before, you know, trusted partner at the center of our customers' financial lives. But you know, I, I, I do think, and I'm, sh I'm sure people do, I, I think if you look at the way people immerse themselves, um, 
you know, they, uh, particularly sort of teenagers and into young adults, it's quite different. You know, gaming, gamification. Uh, you know, I think many people there, you know, they won't understand, uh, you know, interest rate yield curves, but they'll understand it in the context of, you know, what the, the price of buying a sword is and, you know, whatever game I'm playing. Um, you know, and so, oh, not that I'm a proponent of the metaverse, far from it, but, you know, I think there's... I got an email from you on that uh, it, investing in swords. Well, <laughs> you'll instantly know that's a scam. Um, but, you know, I, I do think, uh, you know, and even recently, a few months ago, we, ha we had a session with... Um, with our board, and we brought in a whole range of different customers. I think it's a, you know, it's a fascinating grounding. Just you know, watching and learning and understanding and hearing people's perspectives. There's always a risk that people then extrapolate, you know, mm. from a very small sample, and you get a little bit of confirmation bias amongst all of us. Yes, you, know, so you see what you already, you know, you're looking to see. Um, but you know, I, I think it's a really important part for us is really understanding what customers are doing, what they want to do, how do we help them, how do we support them. I think that fundamental role for a financial institution is really rel is in many ways unchanged, but the way we actually deliver that is changing you know, quite dramatically. Because is your, your, stat, uh, your younger customers are accessing your app 40 times a month? Yeah, yeah, I mean, look, we, we've had very strong digital engagement. Um, you know, and I think for, as a business, we, we'd have one of the highest levels in terms of just number of logins per day. I think we peaked during COVID at more than 10 million sort of daily logins. And yes, the frequency of that tends to skew or even skew. Younger cohorts are engaging and, and logging in even more rapidly. Part of the opportunity for us is, is to try to work out how to deliver more value and relevance and personalization you know, not in a sort of addictive experience that you, you might argue, you know, non-banking apps uh, compete in, but you actually want people coming back because there's real relevance. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, I think looking at, um, you know, some of the way, and you see a lot of industries at the moment as well, just converging, uh, who are really competing over the, uh, wanting to have the primacy of that customer relationship and engagement. We, we don't believe, and we certainly don't, want our products to be commoditized. We think that direct engagement within, with customers and having sort of relevance and sort of, you know, imagine the front screen of, the, uh, of anyone's mobile phone is gonna be a really important um, aspect. And, uh, you know, that's a, that's a big part of where we're trying to invest our, um, our dollars into making sure that experience is really differentiated in the Australian market. Mm. I think there's different ways of looking at demographics um, as well. Um, you know, as populations change, so for example, as you alluded to, you know, in Australia we have a, a, a significant ageing of the population. People living longer, people living actively longer. Um, and, and when that happens, human, it changes the way human beings behave and the way families and individuals relate to each other. And that sometimes manifests itself through money and finances. So we're already seeing a whole lot of quite different things. Um, you know, at the sort of end of the spectrum where you've got more and more parents um, surviving well into their 80s and 90s, sometimes very frail and perhaps not always um, with all of their cognitive functions. Um, but it means that their adult children are not inheriting till they're in their 60s and 70s. And there has been a significant increase in the financial abuse of older people. And part of the explanation that a lot of the people who work with this is that there's this sort of element of um, inheritance in patients, this sense that it's actually mine and, it, you know, and it's taking, and I need the money now for me and my kids and that sense of entitlement. So there's, that's one of the issues that banks are dealing with increasingly, that issue around the abuse of older customers financially um, and trying to manage all those complicated things like powers of attorney and you know, people selling, selling the family home and all those sorts of things. Um, but there's also, at the other end, house prices rising to the point um, you know, where more and more people are only getting in with the help. Um, so you don't wait for your parents to die to get the inheritance. They're actually helping you while they're alive. But you know, the bank of mum and dad is playing a much bigger role, isn't it, Matt, in, mm -hmm. the, um, in, in the way that younger people are accessing um, and getting into, uh, getting a deposit and getting into the housing market or into any other kind of asset class. So there's, um, you know, there, there's some really, you know, the way that you might think about the stages of life is also changing and it's got, it plays out financially in different ways. And that's going to keep happening. Oh, I'm going to have to wrap up, but I might just uh, finish perhaps just asking for a few thoughts on 
the road ahead and whether you're each feeling optimistic about what the banking sector is looking uh, into uh, in, the, in the new year. Yep, happy to start. Uh, personally, yes, very much so. I mean, I, I think economically, um, you know, very strong conditions. Our economics team, which is probably um, the more optimistic scale, you know, we're at 4% uh, unemployment, 5% GDP during calendar year, first rate rise in November uh, next year. And, you know, you, you see that they're sort of right in the target band on inflation. I think wages growth coming through, I think there'll be an, a, a good tailwind coming through over this, you know, holiday period into into next year, and, and I think that will be, you know, a, a welcome relief after, uh, you know, a pretty sort of stop-start uh, period. I mean, um, lots of things that we're, we're dealing with, and some, you know, some of the what we were talking about earlier. I think, you know, what's hard about the current environment as well is that, um, you know, obviously with rates as low as they are, it puts a lot of pressure on different parts of the economy, and we see that. I, I'm sure the Reserve Bank gets the same sort of proportion, proportion of uh, feedback. Uh, complaints around interest rate environment and impact on, on depositors. That's put a lot of pressure on, on sectors of, of our customers, certainly by scale much larger than those that are by number, uh, by borrowing. And, you know, I get it. When, when rates are really low, I think everyone's looking for a shortcut at the moment. You know, and I think that's why, you know, an asset prices are running hard. There's a lot of speculation. You know, so I think, uh, you know, perhaps a more normal interest rate environment, not that we're going to move to that uh, quickly, I think that's I think that's good, uh, and you know overall, but you know based on where we see it, I think it's hard. I think a hard place to find somewhere to that you'd rather be, uh, you know, as as an industry. And I think there's lots of opportunities to come, and we've talked about some of them with energy and, uh, but you know, I, I think there's huge potential for Australia there. Um, over over many years, and that's 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 a really exciting place to be. Looking forward to next year. Great, Anna. Uh, you know, ditto on all of that. Um, as I said at the beginning, I think there's a lot to be optimistic about, uh, in, particularly in 2022. Um, we will see, uh, I think, at a macro level, we will see quite a bit, you know, the big, the big numbers, GDP and others, unemployment, I think they're going to be very healthy numbers, but I think underneath them it's going to be pretty choppy for some sectors. Uh, and it's hard to predict exactly which ones they will be. But um, just as there will be some who don't make it, I think we're going to see a lot of innovation and um, or a lot of the innovation that started out of necessity by in some sectors um, is going to see the growth of new businesses and new business models. And I think that's going to be quite exciting. I think for the industry as a whole, um, some of the issues we've talked about tonight, um, particularly the payment system um, and climate, are going to be much, much bigger um, issues to grapple with. And they're going to be much more. Um, they're going to occupy a lot more of the industry's time um, than has been the case in the last couple of years. Um, and by no means um, can the industry, or does the industry, want in any way to take its eye off the ball on conduct and culture. And to that end, um, the banking code of practice is uh, just about to see the beginning, see the final report of its triennial review and we'll have a new banking code um, as it evolves. I, I should say I did notice the, the our evolving banking sector is the title of tonight's um, uh, discussion and I, I, think, I think of the word evolve as something that happens gradually, like evolution. I don't think that is happening in the banking sector. I think it's, it's fast, it's hard, it's going at pace and we can expect to see more of that in 22 and 23. And that makes it a pretty exciting thing to be, uh, place to be. Um, and I would just um, uh, also end by saying that for the ABA, of course, in 2022, uh, we'll have a new chair. And I do want to take the opportunity tonight um, to embarrass Matt by just thanking him. Uh, Matt came into the job, um, I think, uh, well, formally elected in December 19. Uh, his first meeting was the last face-to-face uh, -face meeting we had for um, 18 months. Yeah. And, um, uh, I think we schedule four council meetings a year, and in his first eight weeks, Matt had 13 um, council meetings. Uh, so, you know, when you, th these are jobs of service, uh, they're important as part of the policy making and regulatory framework of the country, uh, and most people who take them on don't expect a global pandemic. So, um, thank you, Matt. I think you've done um, a tremendous right. job. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. That's a great note to finish on. I think Melinda's just going to uh, say, say a few words and then uh, let us go. But uh, thank you so much for sharing those thoughts. Thanks, Richard. Third time lucky for you all tonight. Um, Richard, I was having a look at the questions coming through Pigeonhole. Uh, great job. I mean, there were just so many and you, you managed them beautifully in terms of picking up the main theme. So thank you so much and thank you again to Alan's for um, sponsoring tonight's uh, dinner. Um, Anna and Matt, such a fascinating conversation and so exciting to hear the optimism um, and the enthusiasm and excitement around innovation um, and the role of the banks in driving that within their own businesses, uh, but also in fostering that more broadly throughout the economy. And I think we'll all go home with the sense of the contribution to the national interest, which really resonates with me because that, of course, is um, core to CEDA's purpose. And, and I think you just did such a great job of highlighting the important role that sectors like bank, the banking sector play in terms of um, enabling competition and driving that, but also when they need to, coming together and um, pulling together the best of the things that they shouldn't be competing on. And you know, one of the great things that we try to focus on at CEDA is that economic growth and prosperity is so crucial, but you, you need to make sure that it connects to as many people as possible. And, and you both spoke really about the consumer, and, but also that we provide the, the right safety nets. And I was really taken by your conversation around not competing on domestic violence and making sure that you're doing what you can to drive that, such an important sector to provide for everyone in the way that they should. So it was a really fascinating conversation and I think you'll all agree, tremendous leadership um, shown by all three of you tonight. Um, and I hope that we, we see a, a year next year that is as optimistic um, as, as we're hearing on the stage. My fingers are crossed um, because it really um, feels like we're due for it, if I can put it that way. Um, now, it would be remiss of me. I know everyone's thinking about Christmas. I know everyone's tired, but it, you've got to get onto the cedar.com.au website. We are not finishing just yet. There's a ton of events still ploughing through to the end of the year, so please have a look at them, many of which related directly to the topics that we're being spoken about tonight. If you're not sick of me, tomorrow I'm actually hosting a live stream with the leadership, the um, Climate Leadership Council, David Thody, talking about the tremendous role that business is playing in driving um, Australia's response to decarbonisation and, and climate change, and there's a ton uh, more. Thank you again for coming tonight. I am really pleased to see you. I'm loving being back here, obviously, because I don't want to give up the stage. When you're sick of all the seat events and you get closer to Christmas, please have a fantastic holiday. Um, enjoy spending time with your friends and family. Hopefully we all get to get out and about a little bit more. Uh, and I'm looking forward to being back up in Sydney often next year. Thank you very much. Thank you.